All right. Um, where's the clicker? Here we go. All right, so let's get, to, let's get going. Um, you know, I look around the room. I will say this. I was extremely lucky, and a couple other people in this room were as lucky as I was. We had Steve Ross as our advisor. And Steve Ross did a lot of good for us. One of the things he did was he, he, he emphasized the importance of theory at a time when other people didn't realize that. And as a result, we could write papers that other people couldn't write because we understood the theory. And then there was this change where other people understood theory, and unfortunately, the world's going back to a world where we're just forgetting theory. So why don't we start with a bit of theory, okay? Let's start with the very first question that we, that, that we need to ask, is why do we need an asset pricing model? Now why, do we, why does asset pricing exist? Well, the answer is because we need to know how to calculate the cost of capital. That is why we do asset pricing, okay? So, um, why do we, and so why do we need a model? Why don't we just look at the return in the history, of the history of returns and take the average? Why don't we do that? The answer is, it's hopeless. Returns are just too noisy to estimate the cost of capital from past returns. So you give that up. And so that's why we need a model. We need a, we need a reliable way to estimate the cost of capital. Right. So, enter the capital asset pricing model. This was a huge step forward because it allowed us to estimate the cost of capital. Why is that? Because we only need to know betas. Betas are variances. We can estimate variances. The only parameter left that we need to estimate is the risk premium of the market. That we can't estimate. Well, it's a, first of all, we should understand the risk premium of the market is much easier to estimate than the expected return of a stock. Right? One, it's a portfolio, so there's much less noise. The other thing is, you might suppose that the risk premium is constant in time. So if you have 100 years of data, you can estimate it. There's no reason in the world that the expected return of a stock should be constant in time. So there's that huge advantage. But there's an even more important advantage, that we can, from economic arguments, get an estimate of the risk premium. Right? We, don't, we can say, OK, well, 10% that's probably not right. 2% is probably too low. We can estimate the risk premium, and that's actually what we do today. Most people say, use 4%, right? All right, so that enter the CAPAM. Now we can cal calculate the cost of capital. This is a huge advantage, OK? Problem, model doesn't work, or it doesn't work very well. So what do we do? So we say, OK, well, we like that intuition. Why don't we expand the model? Why don't we generalize the model? Why don't we write down factor models? OK, so that's why we started writing factor models. But in thinking about factor models, you have to keep the objective in mind, OK? If the factor model is going to be useful, you need to know the risk premium of the factors, which means the factors have to be economic, right? If you just throw in any factor and you don't know the risk premium, we're back to square one, right? So that means there can't be too many factors, because you've got to know what these things are. OK? And the factors have to have economic meaning. All right. That's why we do asset pricing. Now, let's keep going on the theory, OK? Um, you know, it's interesting. Russell's name never even came up. I mean, you know, if we're going to talk about factor models, you'd think Russ would be one of the, would be one of the uh, citations. All right. Um, OK, so let's just go through some of the results that Ross and others derived. Um, so no arbitrage implies that an SDF exists, OK? That SDF is not unique, OK? It's only unique if the market is complete. But the projection of that US SDF on the asset span is unique, and it's the mean variance efficient portfolio. That projection is mean variance efficient, OK? Bit of asset pricing there. Now, here is a result which, interestingly enough, I don't think has ever been derived. It's kind of obvious, but it's never been derived, OK? A factor model will price assets if and only if the mean variance efficient portfolio, the SDF, is in the span of the factors, OK? It's a pretty easy result to prove. It's 
it's an update, whatever. But it's an important, it's a, it, we, we, okay. So uh, 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 the intuition, here's the intuition. Uh, 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 if the mean various efficient portfolio is in the span, and you just set the factor weights to the mean variance efficient portfolio and it'll price. Um, if it's not in the span, project onto the span, that will price, and it'll be a lower mean, it'll be a lower variance. So this is, so mean variance efficiency, for factor models to work, the mean variance efficient portfolio has to be in the span. Okay. It's on the side. So that's how I think of factor models, okay? The failure of the cap air means the market is not in, is, is the market is not mean variance efficient. So what, the, what we need to do is, if we just find the mean variance efficient portfolio, everything will work. So why, instead of just specifying just the market, let's specify a range of factors. Obviously, the more factors you specify, the more likely the mean variance efficient portfolio will be in the span. And so that's the way I think about factor models. Okay. So the question is, how can I guarantee that the mean variance efficient portfolio is in the span? There's a very simple way. Set the number of factors equal to the number of assets. It has to be in the span. We're done. We've got the, SP we've got the SPF, right? But the problem is that you have a contentless model at that point, right? You could make each factor the, re the return of each asset, right? It's going to work perfectly. We don't know. What, we're back to square one. We're back to the return of the asset. We don't know the risk. We can't estimate the expected return of the asset. In this case, it would be the factor, right? So we're back to square one. It's a contentless model. So the trick of asset pricing is not to have a lot of factors. In order to figure out the cost of capital, we need a few number of factors so we can know what the risk premium of each factor is. Okay. Now this paper. I do not, for the life of me, understand why you need infinitely many factors. If you want to get the SDF, you need the number of factors equal to the number of assets. I do not, for the life of me, understand why you need any more. Okay? Maybe somebody can explain that to me. Okay? So then what does the paper add? Okay. Well, I have a bunch of questions. See, the paper's full of mathematics, right? And I'm a discussant. There's only a limited amount of time I'm getting through that mathematics, right? So I have a few questions, okay? The first question is in the empirical work, they, they have something called an SDF portfolio, right? The question is, I don't really understand how, because this SDF portfolio is a function of infinitely many factors, right? You only need the finite number of factors, so I don't understand why you need infinitely many. Of course, the factors are all nonlinear generators, right? I mean, the models are linear models, so, you could, so it's a, the span of nonlinear factors is much bigger, right? Which suggests to me then that the SDF portfolio is not in the span of the assets. Right? That's what I think is going on, okay? So it's, if the SDF portfolio is not in the span of the assets, why don't they just project back down onto the span, and then we're back to uh, uh, the number of factors equaling the number of assets? If it isn't the span, then I'm back to square one. Why do you need more, why do you need more factors than you have assets? Okay? Now, the objective of the paper is another confusing thing. I don't know why we're, what purpose are we maximizing the Sharpe ratio? Um, uh, I, I don't record a result stating that the SDF maximized the Sharpe ratio. My confusion here is there are many SDFs. How could all of them maximize the Sharpe ratio? It's true the projection on the, on the assets band does, because that's the mean variance efficient portfolio. But in general, I don't see it, okay? Uh, and then I, I mean, I, you know, the paper has lots of verbiage in it that, yeah, you know, I, I admit I'm old, so maybe I just don't understand it, but I don't understand the sentence. We proved that an expected out of sample model performance in terms of the SDF of the Sharpe ratio and the test asset pricing is improving in model parameterization. I don't know what the SDF Sharpe ratio, in terms of the SDF, what is the SDF Sharpe ratio? Why, why is that, I mean, I don't know why that's relevant. Anyway, okay. Another suggestion might be that, uh, that uh, the, the, the language in the paper could actually speak to somebody who understands asset pricing theory. So my conclusion is I think the authors need to better explain the purpose of the paper and what it adds to the literature. 
in, the most important thing, they, sh they should explain what, what is interesting about identifying a nonlinear transformation of returns that has a high sharp ratio. And I don't think it's in the asset sphere. I'm done.